Good morning, folks. We've got new Sky Scholar, a super fun announcement, and we're going to stitch together peer-reviewed literature for a major slap to climate science. We're starting with our star at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last day on the sun was pretty quiet. The only activity is at the departing limb on the south, some filaments releasing, and there have been no solar flares either. The solar wind and geomagnetic conditions are both calm as the plasma stream has settled back into normal range. And so let's look at the only releases from the sun here on the departing limb. You can see the filaments and associated plasma motions and on SOHO, which looks from Earth's line of sight at L1, shows the CMEs from that activity are all missing Earth by about 90 degrees. As I mentioned, new Sky Scholar video, one of the only channels to which I'm subscribed and his new one is on Haruni's antenna and how it aids in the ongoing examination of Kirchhoff's law. By the way, this is not Dr. Robitaille's only appearance in today's show. But right now, let's move on to climate science and we're starting with one of the most human affecting teleconnections there is, the link between El Nino, La Nina, and the Asian winter monsoon. Through the ENSO, the sun has long been thought to work the Asian monsoon, since the connection is already well established between the sun and ENSO. But here, they're going after the few tiny little pieces of the puzzle that never seemed to fit before, and they're able to identify secondary modulations by the PDO and AMO. Between those two and ENSO, we have nearly the entire story of the winter monsoon, and just like the ENSO, the sun is well known to modulate the PDO and the AMO. Everything that works those large-scale patterns is worked by the sun and geomagnetic activity. Up next, we're at arguably the world's top climate journal finding scientists trying to work out why upper tropospheric warming is overestimated in every model of the atmosphere. They speculate about imperfect convection parameters, but for those who immediately begin thinking, maybe the upper troposphere isn't warming as much because CO2 doesn't have the effect you thought it had. Well, that brings us back to one of the top papers of the year. Yes, it doesn't go into in print until October 15th, but we actually showed you its online pre-release weeks ago. Yes, the warming at the upper troposphere is overestimated, but the CO2 effect at the thermosphere is missing entirely. It is 99% controlled by solar and geomagnetic forcing, and they know the CO2 is getting up there. It's just not doing anything, which implies that the CO2 in the upper troposphere isn't doing much either, which may explain the overestimated warming there and has further implications for what we blame for the warming in the lower troposphere. Let's add a cherry on top. Indeed, auroral flow bursts, solar force, ionic flows at the top of the sky are working the neutrals below it. The same neutral thermosphere where all predicted CO2 forcing is missing is worked by the geomagnetic phenomena strongly enough that they can even pick out dusk-dawn asymmetries and characterize the midnight flows versus others. Speaking of our textbook and solar climate forcing, we figured out a reasonable workaround for the Colorado laws that forced us to shut our store, and in a few weeks, we'll have some more hard copies of our books available again. Until then, you can get the PDFs at otf.cells.com. And last but not least, I promised Dr. Robitaille wasn't done today. His flight and hotel are booked for the springs in early November. He'll be there in special guest capacity and is very eager to meet and chat with many of you. I imagine we're less than 48 hours from selling out, so if you're in the Colorado area, make a night of it. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind maps and shots of our star to close. Subscribe and we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 5.30 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.